Hi, everybody. This is Michael Horn back. Uh, or if it's your first time, this is that you're seeing me. This is my uh, show that is centered on the Billy Meyer UFO contacts. And basically what I do during the show is I kind of extemporaneously will speak about different aspects of the case. I have some bullet points that I like to cover. And in time, we're going to be addressing questions that you may have and uh, making sure that all of the doubts that have floated around about the Billy Meyer case and the different claims that it, it's a hoax and what have you can be satisfactorily answered for you. The, at the very least, I can either explain the information in a way that works for you and or that you can go, of course, freely to my website and or to my blog and to sites that are linked from them and evaluate the information and the evidence for yourself or hopefully for yourselves. That is, if you're multiple personalities or just for yourself, if you only want. Anyhow, you're going to get exactly who I am during the show. And I'm going to try to stick as much as I can to factual stuff. But my perverse sense of humor sometimes invades my space. The thing about extraterrestrials and UFOs, so-called aliens, that I want to address right at the beginning here again is, if there are any extraterrestrials appearing in their craft anywhere in our world, first of all, if we can prove that that's so, we have the single most important discovery, true story in human history. And of course, trumping that, should that be true, being able to authenticate that there are contacts between these extraterrestrials and anybody on Earth would constitute, hands down, the most important true story in all of human history. Think about it. Many of us who are interested in this overall topic kind of take for granted that, well, of course, everybody knows there's extraterrestrials and all UFOs are extraterrestrial objects. And it, it goes from there, it proceeds without any critical thinking too often without any regard for what a phenomenal set of scientific and historic claims we are just assuming are true. In the Meyer case, uniquely speaking, and you'll pardon me if I take a sip or two of tea, there is such an abundance of physical evidence to start with as to be unimaginable for many people. They when they, they encounter Meyer's voluminous photographs, films, videos, sound recordings, the metal samples, the seven-fingered handprints impressed into the surface of car finishes in Switzerland, all of this is an overload. And people assume, oh, it's just a hoax. Some guy in Switzerland had nothing to do had so much time on his one hand, because Meyer is a one-armed, one-armed man, that he was able to take the whole household objects and found objects and construct these really neat looking UFOs and make models, sometimes four of them, so that he could photograph four of them at a time in, in a single frame and film them. And in some cases, to find a way to make such a beautiful, phenomenally clean model that it would, would look very good close up on eight millimeter film. Not only would it look great close up on eight millimeter film, but th that he somehow had a way to mount two separate lights on it that would alternate flash on and off while this object came into view very close and then receded in the distance. In 1976, in the rugged rural Swiss highlands, a one-armed man was pulling all of this off. Of course, at the same time, he was renovating a rundown farmhouse that had, in some cases, only dirt floors, no electricity or running water. He was working as a night watchman. He was raising a family of three children and then going on these contacts and then transcribing them all at up to 100 words per minute with one hand and on and on and on. Being raised, if you have been in the digital online age, dare I say you may not have a completely realistic understanding of what 
a lot of the aspects of what we might call real life really are. Unless, at the same time, you do things such as, uh, well, you live in the country, you work on property, you have to trek here and there, you, you may even be involved in heating your own home and chopping wood and doing things that Mr. Meyer had to do himself for quite some time, and ultimately then with friends of his. By the way, they still chop a lot of wood over there, and they, uh, they bring down trees from the forest that are ready to be uh, harvested or taken down because they're dead. And then they spend their time now with very nice, sophisticated machinery, but still a lot of hand holding, hand, hand process here, of chunking those pieces down into burnable sizes, pieces of firewood. Now, why would I go off into firewood when we're talking about UFOs? Because the real life evidence, the real life experience that Billy Meyer has had for many decades has been uh, rather rugged, rather demanding, and still is living up in the Zurich Highlands there in Switzerland. The weather, especially in winters, is extremely severe, which is why so much wood cutting is is done during the spring when the forest can be safely cleared, the wood stacked so that it can begin the drying process. All right, you want to hear about UFOs and physical evidence, and I'm going to tell you more. When Meyer first started to present, publicly present, his many, many UFO photos, which would ultimately number well over 1,200, they attracted the attention of people in Europe. They attracted the attention of various intelligence agencies, including our own CIA, which in short order, relatively speaking, managed to acquire the access to a military base above Billy Meyer's property so that they could monitor what was going on there. Indeed, in time, the CIA managed to take a few of their own photos of the Play Iron UFOs. However, coming back to all of this evidence, as it became more publicly available, it was presented uh, via mail, old-fashioned concept, the photos were sent in the mail, along with some letters, those used to be written on paper, and included and sent to Wendell Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens at the time, retired U.S. Air Force. He had been tasked since 1947 by the U.S. Air Force with investigating UFOs. At this point in his life, back in the 1970s, 77, 78, he was now retired. And he was still quite interested in UFOs. And when a woman in Germany or Switzerland, I think it may have been Germany, sends him a few of these photos and information about this Billy Edward Albert Meyer living up there in Hinterschmidt-Ruti in Switzerland. Well, he's astounded because they're the clearest photographs of UFOs he's ever seen. They remain the clearest UFO photos you've ever seen to this day. And he was, well, he was quite impressed and he wanted to investigate this case. He had two friends, Lee and Britt Elders. Lee and Britt Elders also lived in Arizona, as did Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, just in a different part. And they were very high level investigators, uh, electronic countermeasures, securing computers, phone lines, uh, clearing rooms of electronic eavesdropping and things for Fortune 500 companies, banks, etc. Uh, they still do that type of work today. But they uh, were invited by Wendell to take a look at this remarkable evidence. And their take on it was, well, Wendell, this does look too good to be true. We think you're about to be suckered into a big hoax. Mm, can we join you on this investigation? So Wendell suddenly had a team, and he acquired other people who would become part of this team, such as Jim Delatoso and Tom Welsh and perhaps other people whose names I don't know. Let me take a moment at this point to simply say that these people, Wendell Stevens, Lee and Britt Elders, Jim Delatoso, Tom Welsh, and any others that assisted them, are historical figures. They are the people that made available to us in this world the awareness, the evidence for this case. They opened the doors to the most important true story in all of human history, in my opinion. So they are owed a tipping of the hat, a nod, thanks, however you want to do it. Okay, so now we have this team that's about to go to Switzerland and investigate the Billy Meyer UFO case. 
Well, imagine this, if you will. In those olden days, in the 1970s, there was something called Tower Air. Tower Air was an airline that you didn't make reservations for. You simply showed up at the counter, bought your ticket, and if there were enough spaces, you were flying. Lee, Wendell, and Britt did this when they went on their trips, virtually all of their trips, certainly back in those early days to Switzerland, and they did it for a few reasons. Um, one of which was it was convenient. The second one was they didn't have to notify and make reservations that would become public knowledge or anything like that. Now the problem was that despite their precautions, they were not anonymous, believe it or not, in their efforts. What happened was that when they arrived for the first time as well in London, which was the, uh, let's say, the hub there for going to other countries in uh, Europe, when they didn't have direct flights from Los Angeles where Tower Air was based, they would go from Phoenix to Los Angeles and fly across. Well, they're greeted by a tall black man, very big fellow in a chauffeur's outfit with a nice hat and everything. And he comes up to them and says, Lieutenant Stevens, Mr. and Mrs. Elders, uh, I have your car for you. And they said, what car? And he said, just follow me. They were taken into central London, into a place that I believe is called Grosvenor House, or Grosvenor House. And it was into offices within this rather large building that they met a man named Mark Nathan. Mark Nathan had previously sent Wendell Stevens some letters. I believe that the... Um, a signature on it had been for the uh, Knights of Malta or something like this. He had actually sent him a couple with different, you know, signatures accrediting him as belonging to different organizations, what have you. Let's cut to the chase here. He was the bureau chief or what have you for the station chief in London for the CIA. Mr. and Mrs. Elders, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, were very interested in... Uh, what you're doing here, and we understand you're going to meet Mr. Meyer, and we'd like your cooperation on this. And so began some well, not exactly voluntary interactions between Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, Lee, and Britt Elders in and out of Zurich as they went in and out uh, through London back to the States and during these trips, they were invited to provide to the CIA copies of any information, photographic evidence, etc., that they might acquire from Mr. Meyer in Switzerland. And each time they were picked up and the CIA took the information into another room where various kinds of copies were made. Now, there are some other interesting stories about this that are told in some videos we have as to events that happened to the CIA uh, chief there and to the Stevens and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens and, and the elders uh, with evidence and things that disappeared before their very eyes practically and, you know, kind of things like that. However, what I'm going to do when we come back, rather than get into that part of the story, I want to go a little more directly into what we're talking about here, the physical evidence, the photographs and what have you. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'll be right back and tell you more about the Billy Meyer UFO contacts. Hi, 
uh, Michael Horn back to speak more about the evidence in the Billy Meyer case. I had been speaking a little bit about the trips to Switzerland through London of the investigative team and, and all that stuff. And there's plenty of information about that online and in videos and what have you. It's, it's fascinating what they experienced. But one of the things that has happened quite a bit since Meyer's photographs and other evidence have been made public, a lot of people have latched on to skeptical complaints about, oh, well, um, we should examine the negatives to the photographs and, you know, how do we know these are real and the, they aren't models. So let me walk us through a little bit of what happened in this process. Wendell Stevens, uh, who was the lead investigator, he was in charge of it all, also had various connections, not only in different UFO groups, which he did, but he, through also some of his partners in his team, had connections to uh, high-level laboratories and facilities through JPL and NASA and, and USGS and what have you. When Stevens had these photographs and it became known that he was going to be working on authenticating Billy Meyer's photographic evidence and examining it anyhow to see if it's authentic, there were people in the UFO world, the UFO communities, that approached Wendell and wanted to participate in those examinations. There were people uh, connected with MUFON, which is a big uh, international UFO organization. We may be speaking more about that uh, organization in some subsequent episodes here. There is also a fellow whose name is Stanton Friedman. Stanton Friedman is a physicist interested in UFOs and has for the longest time made uh, appearances on behalf of presenting information about Roswell. I like to say that Stanton Friedman is a uh, frequent guest on the rubber chicken circuit where he goes around and talks about Roswell and sits down and eats chicken with everybody. Um, the whole deal with talking about Roswell, which by the way from everything I know through the Meyer case and, and that I know through my own experience, which I'll tell you about, uh, was authentic, along with a number of other crashes, some of which actually preceded Roswell, but didn't get the notoriety. The play are on the extraterrestrials that Billy Meyer says he's been in contact with for more than 72 years, whose craft he's photographed, filmed, and videotaped, etc., etc., have said, indeed, Roswell was a genuine real event. They didn't capture extraterrestrials. What, what remained with the craft uh, was a crew of android beings that had been created by the actual people in the Zeta Reticulum star system who send out these various scout craft in different places to gather information. So there's a lot of disinformation still connected with it, and there's no remaining tangible, verifiable evidence from Roswell itself that could be put on the table, examined. So uh, Stanton Friedman's got a delightful gig walking around talking about something that he actually can't prove, true as it may be. He was one of the people that wanted in on this examination of the Meyer family. But Wendell said no to all of them. And the reason for it was he didn't want, in effect, to contaminate, if you will, the credibility of the investigation and the evidence with people who were in the UFO community, which has now become the UFO industry. Alien this, alien that. So he went through his connections and connections of other people in his group to JPL, NASA, and others, but he was not allowed at the time to reveal that they were giving him access to their laboratories, to their facilities, to their equipment. And indeed, they apparently discovered through the examination of Myers photos, new techniques and technologies that they could use to work on such you know, examinations, uh, computer techniques and what have you. I'm not technologically very savvy about this. Another sip of tea though, which has apparently transformed itself into water. I am available for parties. Okay, so we have this whole need to know silence uh, disclosure form type of thing uh, that Stevens and his team has to sign off on so they cannot reveal who's been authenticating and you know where they're having it done. 
However, we have the reports freely available up on the website, theyfly.com. Some of this photo analysis, they took four of Meyer's very good photos. They used for what was at the time state-of-the-art analysis. They gave the, you know, very discreet descriptions of how and why they could tell that this was authentic. No models were used at that time, 1975 to 78, 80. No home computers, no special effects, no digital effects possible. So, this hasn't been good enough, of course, for many skeptics. Oh no, we've got to see the original negatives. We are the real and true experts, and just because we weren't there, the whole thing should be redone. Well, I'm going to get to how we can answer that very nicely, but let's talk just a little bit more about the authentication of his evidence. Meyer also uh, took films, of course, 8mm films, of the craft, and those were examined by experts at Nippon TV, Japan. And that's actually, we have some of that information in our films. There's actually other films online showing the whole thing, all of the Meyer footage you can look at. And the experts there realized, they came to the conclusion with thorough examination, there was no splicing of the films. There was no adulteration. They weren't models. Uh, these were real objects, apparently quite large, that this man was filming with a eight millimeter film camera. The investigators went so far, of course, as to track down, without much difficulty, the Photoshop where Meyer not only bought his cameras and film, but where he brought all of his film, still, still photos, as well as the movie footage to be examined, and to, uh, not to be examined so much, actually to be developed, I should say, and I will say, it, to be developed. And Meyer never himself purchased any kind of uh, darkroom equipment, chemicals, any of the stuff necessary for doing his own photographic work. So people who thought that Meyer was setting up these scenes and, and then developing his own film and what have you, there was no truth to it. And we're going, since we're going back to the you know, 1970s in this very rural part of Switzerland, there weren't a whole bunch of, you know, shops around. And basically, uh, for those of you that can remember not too long ago, you'd get your little yellow envelope back and there would be negatives and there'd be photographs and what have you. When they interviewed the people who owned the shop, the Bear, I think it was called Bear Photo, uh, they asked them all sorts of questions to try to determine what they had seen. And in every case, they said, well, Whenever we get the photographs back uh, from the laboratory, we open up, we look to make sure that the, you know, negatives, the, the, uh, the strips there are intact, and we go through the photos to make sure there's nothing bad, or et cetera, et cetera. So they were asked, well, did you ever see uh, any photos that looked like uh, they were retakes, setups of shots? And they said, well, wh what do you mean? These were always sequential on the, you know, on the strips of film, and Photos came in, and all numbered in order, and they were photographs of these weird things that Mr. Meyer is taking pictures of. And there's no models, and there's no mistakes in here, and whatever you're talking about. So they were sincere, genuine people. It was pretty obvious that Meyer was not tricking anything. As a matter of fact, at one point, the investigators loaded Meyer's camera themselves with a roll of 35 millimeter film, uh, you know, photos, as for slides or, or uh, prints. And they sent him off because he was going to have a, um, a contact with the play iron. He came back a couple hours later. They unloaded the camera. They had the film developed. And lo and behold, there's something like 34 photographs of UFOs. So you start to have to put all these pieces in place in terms of real life. People that spend their time on the Internet thinking that if they just search here and there and pull in skeptical commentaries, that they're understanding what really occurred, it's not all – It's it's completely different. Think about it this way. Nowadays, I know that there's a number of really good detective shows on TV. Uh, most of them, perhaps, at least in the States, are uh, focusing quite a bit on the technology, the DNA and magnifying this and that. All good detective work, all real police and detective work, relies on you know, the footwork, the people that have to think through, the Sherlock Holmes type of deduction, observation, evidence, examination. And there's kind of a classic trio of, of 
they call it means, motive, and opportunity when looking at a quote-unquote crime. Very often, it's, it's the stuff that many detective stories, uh, you know, focus on. And going back decades for detective and TV shows that didn't have any of the fancy technologies we had, means, motive, you know, opportunity. Meyer had no technological means. He had a 35 millimeter uh, camera that was had a broken, uh, I forget what it's called, it won't take the time. He could only turn it to infinity. It was stuck on infinity, and I think he could get some closer stuff, but basically it's stuck on infinity. So he couldn't do any kind of real manipulation even with his own camera. All of this has been documented. They know what kind of camera he used, the kind of film, etc. Again, you're going to have to figure this out for yourself. And now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, before, I won't have time today to go into everything about the sound recordings and the four different sound studios that tested Meyer's cassette recorded sounds of the beam ships that were recorded in front of as many 17 people, including an undercover policeman. Those sounds remained irreproducible. They are irreproducible today. Probably only can be reproduced with very sophisticated computers because the last attempt made about a year or two ago, even with computer, failed. Here's the kicker. There's something called the WC UFO, that's the wedding cake UFO. Meyer took 63 photos of it. He was within 20 feet of that craft for a number of those photos. It was literally landed in his front yard. Now, you look at those photos and you say, this has got to be a hoax. This thing is just too strange to be true. And indeed, so many people took that tack. One guy in England made a very excellent model of it, and he took photographs of it. And to, initially to the eye, they were almost indistinguishable. Oh, it's obviously a hoax. Then a funny thing happened. Apart from the fact that there's a really nice five-minute video of Meyer in the video, too, with the, the craft, a professor in South America took the time and trouble to use various uh, state-of-the-art software technologies to examine a couple of those wedding cake UFO photos. He put his analyses in a document and he put two or three different videos online. All of this is linked from my website and my blog. And he showed that this is a full-size object. There may be two objects between 14 and 21 or so, 23 feet in diameter. That this is no model. And he enlarged details. He had some of the photos digitized. Enlarged the details of this craft. The photos are freely available. You're going to see a couple links here. The first link is probably going to take you to where you can see some of these photos of the WC UFO and some of the detail. The second one, this is the beauty of the whole thing. Forget about negatives for Billy's photographs, which are probably long gone. You're going to see a nighttime photograph of the WC UFO, wedding cake UFO. It's glowing gold against a black background. And of course, all the genius skeptic says, well, it's just a model against a black curtain. Now, if you click on that photo in my blog, you'll see it enlarges nicely to a big enlarged version. Now, I did exactly what Professor Zahi said to do with that photo. I dropped it into Photoshop. And believe me, I know just about nothing about Photoshop, except how to do the basic thing. There it is. And he said, increase the contrast and increase the brightness. And I did that. And those results that you see there in that blog where the ship is suddenly hovering above a graveled road and grass along, alongside there, that's what I got. My bet is that you're going to get the same effect. Now, I can tell you something without revealing who it was. Just today, here, I was on phone and online with a man who is at a company that is extreme high-tech. I'm talking laser stuff and way beyond me. He was very excited. Why? Because when he had emailed me, introduced himself to me, I emailed him back and I sent him that link that you see right there. And I said, hey, take a look at the, you know, the videos that Raul Zahi put up and then plop that photo in Photoshop. 
We had a very interesting, very excited conversation today. He's one of now at least three very high-tech individuals who will remain anonymous for right now, who said to me, that's real. I said, yeah, I know. He says, I know too. I work with stuff, technology way above this, but that is right there, that's enough. That does it. Because folks, how does a man living in rural Switzerland in 1981 with no technology other than his little Nikon camera, take a color photograph on film, 35 millimeter film, 32, 33 years ago, never draws attention to it himself, just publishes his stuff. Do you think that he figured out at that time how to trick our 21st century Photoshop technology that hadn't been invented yet? So I'm going to leave you today to do this yourself. You can know in a matter of two, three minutes that Billy Meyer is telling the truth, that he takes photographs of extraterrestrial craft. He meets with these people to this day for 72 years, and they are trying to help us, help ourselves to assure our own very threatened future survival. More about that to come. Thanks for indulging me again. Until next time.